So what you're seeing is the bare minimum of an application written with Qt Quick controls. We are, import, uh, we are importing the Qt Quick 2.1 namespace, we're importing Qt Quick controls 1.0, which is new in Qt 5.1, and we're declaring an application window with a certain width and a certain height in pixels. If we press run, you can actually see this application already. And if I assign something like a title to the thing, Qt rocks for instance, you will see that you immediately change the title of that window. If you want to put some interesting features in this window, all you have to do is declare them like this, anchors center in parent, I'm just declaring my button to be centered in the window, and I'm going to say the text is push me, and I run that, and I already have a beautiful little button in my window that stays centered due to the anchors. So what if we want the button to do something? Let's say change the color of the window, then you have to give the window an ID, so I'll call my window root, and I'll re-implement the onclick handler of the button and I'm going to say that the root.color should change to cocky when I press the button. That's how, oops, I actually need to spell color correctly, and I run that and I press the button and it turns cocky. So what if I want to put my button on a toolbar instead? I simply create a toolbar and assign it to the application windows toolbar property and paste my button onto the toolbar. And that's how easy it is to create a toolbar. So what if you want to lay multiple buttons out on a toolbar? Well, we have introduced a new thing in that for in Qt 5.1, and that is the import Qt quick layout module. And the layout module gives you gives you a row layout. Uh, you previously had access to row positioner previous uh, in Qt quick before, but the row layout adds some interesting new cool features that I'm going to demonstrate now. So, for instance, if there is multiple buttons in the toolbar. In this case, I have three buttons. I can actually change one of these colors to green, just to show that they're doing different things. Let's say you want to add a stretchable item in the toolbar, for instance, a slider. I can say layout.fill with true. I can add a text field at the end. And if I really want the, the rollout to stretch across the toolbar, I'm going to also have to say that the width of the toolbar is equal to parent.width. So if I run this, you will see that the slider becomes a stretchable control. And the reason it's doing that is because I said the slider should fill the remaining width of my toolbar. So that's how we can create a toolbar very easily with Qt Quick Controls. Normally I wouldn't use buttons in the toolbar because they look kind of awkward there. I'll use a tool button. And uh, let me just quickly change to that instead. And I'll say that the icon source of this guy should be icons document save dot png and I'll do a document open and I'll do a view refresh. So just a bunch of pre-made icons that I have stored. So there you go. That's a beautiful toolbar created with Qt Quick Controls. One thing that uh, one thing that layouts enable you to do is that you can set minimum width and minimum height and make sure that your window doesn't shrink below reasonable sizes. For instance, in this case, I can keep going until my toolbar has completely collapsed. If I want to prevent that, what you will do is you will set the minimum width of your window to a certain value. In this case, I'll give my toolbar a name. I'll call it main toolbar. In this case, you can set it to main toolbar's implicit width. And the implicit width of a toolbar ensures that it contains all the implicit widths of the items contained in that toolbar or in that layout. So uh, doing that means that I cannot size my window smaller than this. So that's a nice way of ensuring that your applications feel solid regardless of what is on it. And if you don't like that minimum width that I have defined for the slider, you can also say that the implicit width of the slider is actually smaller than that, say 150. And I, now I'm allowed to shrink it down to 150 pixels. So that's basically how you work with toolbars. Uh, they become a lot more powerful once you start looking at the grid layout and the column layout, but we don't have time to show off everything in this tutorial. I can briefly also show how the column, uh, how the column layout works just by creating a group box. So you create a group box, you set a title, Spell group box correctly, 
and you can throw in a column layout and you can throw in a radio button and you can say that the text of the radio button is button 1 and you can say anchors center in parent on that group box. This is how you create a group box and there you have three buttons. They're now currently all checkable and they're all independent. If you want to make them uh, exclusive, you're going to have to create an exclusive group. And you have to assign this exclusive group to the buttons. And let's do that for all of them. You run this and you have exclusive radio buttons. And this exclusive group works for tool buttons and it also works for menu actions. And it works for um, pretty much anything that is checkable. So it briefly shows how to create a group box and how to create an exclusive group. So what if we want to create some actual application logic in here? And uh, I'm going to demonstrate by th that by creating a table view, which is another new thing we're adding in Qt 5.1. The table view is basically like uh, the list view we have had in Qt, Qt Quick before, but it adds the convenient things that we've had in item views in traditional widgets, where you get a native looking feel, you get some default delegates, you get keyboard navigation and scroll bars and you get rearrangeable column headers. So it adds most of the things that have been missing in Qt Quick. In order to use it, you have to create at least one table column, set the title, and you have to set some sort of model. I'm going to fake a model by saying there's just 20 items. So there's your raw basic table view. As you can see, it just looks like a regular uh, Mac style item view or item list. If you want this to connect this to real data, we can cheat a little bit and use a pre-made model, which is the XML list model. It's a little bit out of the scope of this presentation to explain how it works. But what you can basically do with the XML list model, you can query a web API. In this case, I'm passing the string cat as an argument to this website, which is the api.flickr.com. Flickr will respond with a web page, and the XML list model would parse that web page and extract title, data, source, and credit properties from that model or from that web page it gets as a result. And a lot of web APIs work this way. So this is usable for Flickr, for Twitter, and a bunch of other commonly used web APIs. So I'm just going to show quickly how to use that model instead of my fake model. I'll paste it in here. It's called Flickr model. And since I'm now using the XML list model, I also have to import that into my namespace. So that's my model. I will replace this uh, model, the, the fake 20 item model I had, with the actual Flickr model. And in my table view column, I have to say which property or which one of these roles that I'm extracting I should display in this table view. And in this case, I'm going to show the role called title, which is the title of the search result we're getting from Flickr. So if I show this, we already get live data, and it's a bit risky to actually show the, the live feed of Twitter in here, so I hope I don't find anything offending. But uh, what you're seeing here is just a title of a bunch of images we're getting from Flickr. So this is live data in our application. If I want to actually look at one of these pictures, I can connect them to an image element, which is one of the existing pre-built elements we're having in, uh, built into Qt Quick. And if I want to lay them out nicely on screen, I'm going to create a splitter. So splitters are created by declaring a split view and doing, and I'm going to fill whatever is left on my screen real estate with a split view. I'm going to put the table view in there, and I'm going to put an image as the second item in my split view. So I have a table view on the left side, and I have an image on the right side. A splitter can be both horizontal or vertical, or you can nest them. So in this case, um, out of the box, the image won't show anything. But we want to connect, we want to extract the actual source property from the Flickr model whenever the index of my table view changes. So I'm going to remove the centering parent here. I'm going to give my table view a name. Let's call it uh, Flickr table. And I'm going to declare that my the source property for my image is equal to 
Flickr table dot model. Actually, I could just uh, I could also directly just refer to Flickr model. Flickr model dot get Flickr table dot current row, which is the current uh, indicated row dot source. So Yes, the initial, the initial value is going to be invalid, but now you can see I'm already extracting the source property and setting it on the image. One snag about the, uh, the Flickr API is that actually it returns a thumbnail by default, and if you look at the URL, actually I can show a nice little trick for displaying the URL on the status bar. Let's just create the status bar. So creating a status bar is very similar to creating a toolbar. You just declare it like this, and we can say that it has a label on it. And the text of the label, I'll just call it label. And the text of the label should be similar to the image's source property. Or we can just use, we can use the same way of getting it, or we can just refer to image. So now you can see that whenever I change my, uh, my search results here, this URL changes on my status bar. So this is how easy it is to change to set these things together. And the search result I'm getting for Flickr indicates the underscore s at the edge there, at the end of the file name. Uh, you would actually like to use b if you want high quality pictures. So I can just show a quick hack to get the proper, proper image. Instead of using the underscore s, I'm going to basically do a dot replace and replace all the instances of underscore s with underscore b. This is just a quick hack, so I'm not saying this is a really clean way of doing it, but now you can say it says underscore b. And we're actually, if I double click here, it should actually be able to fetch the large version of the image. Now you can say it actually takes some time. And the reason it takes some time is that these images are pretty big and I'm on a pretty slow network. So what I'd like to do is to throw in the progress bar. And as you might imagine, throwing a progress bar in is as simple as it was with creating the toolbar layout. We're going to create a row layout on the status bar. We're going to declare a progress bar. And I'm going to say that the value of the progress bar is equal to the image's progress. That's this image right here, which is loaded from Flickr. And um, I also want my label to take up whatever space is remaining. So I'm going to say uh, layout.fill with on it, and I want some aligning in case there is not enough room to fit the label. So I'm going to say the aligning is text.alight middle, for instance. So if I show this, you will have a progress bar, and you will have a beautiful, actually I need to also set, uh, declare that the width is parent width property, just like we did for the toolbar. So now you can see that you have a beautiful little progress bar. So that's how easy it is to create and, and hook these things together. Also, I noticed that the little uh, that my image has the incorrect uh, aspect ratio. So I think we can set the fill mode to preserve aspect fit. So now it should look a little bit nicer by cropping on the edges. So uh, another thing I would like to do, I would like to polish this application a little bit by saying that my table view shouldn't draw its border. I'm going to say frame visible false just to add a little bit of nicer aesthetics around the edges here. And one more thing I could do with this application is that I could allow to search for different things than cats on Flickr by hooking up this text field. So hooking up the text field, I'm just going to declare that the text field is called search field. And if you remember our little Flickr model, there is a search tag cat in here. We can simply replace this with search field dot text. Meaning, I run this application and I type in dog in here, and we're gonna do a new Flickr search, and the result set is gonna contain dogs instead. This is a pretty heavy image. So there you go. This is how easy it is to create a resizable desktop application using Qt Quick. So, um, what if you wanna see how this application looks and feels like on Windows? Well, all I have to do is to take the exact same source code, move it into my Windows environment, 
paste it in there, press run, and you will see the exact same application showing up with a native look and feel on Windows. So you can see this is entirely cross-platform and you get the exact same sort of behavior that you're used to from regular Qt widgets. So I think that basically concludes what I wanted to show off in, in how to create an application. I can also briefly demonstrate some of the um, some of the other controls we're having by showing the component gallery. Um, here we have uh, things like combo boxes, we have spin boxes, uh, we have sliders, we have uh, tabs, here's the item views, you have rearrangeable columns, we have support for custom styling, you can see a nice little bubble effect down in our progress bar, and you can see we have custom styling for tabs, we have movable tabs, and we have a bunch of other layouts. So, I hope that has made you a little bit intrigued about uh, trying out Qt Quick Controls in Qt 5.1. And uh, that's it. Happy coding!